We are going to focus on natural intelligence. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I want to set uh, the right expectations for for this talk. A little bit sort of shift in, in focus, and I decided to uh, talk a little bit at a higher level and. Um, it's, it's not going to be as technical. It's intended to be sort of more thought-provoking. And I'll tell you a little bit about sort of what we're doing with, um, uh, with the Center for Engineered National Intelligence. So about three years ago, I decided to shut down my wet lab and focus on theory and computation. And um, we started this center with uh, Gert Kallenberg and Henry Barbonell in physics and Tim Gettner in psychology. And the entire focus was really to take our understanding of the brain and the neurobiology and go into engineering. So what could we abstract away sort of from the squishy biology that the brain is made from, uh, keep the algorithms and the concepts, and do engineering with that? Um, and I'll show you an example of that as the talk progresses. And then, but then also close the loop, come right back and take that, that engineering approach coming from the neuroscience gives us a new perspective on the biological brain. And so sort of closing the loop and can we make new discoveries about the brain from the engineering? And I'll show you sort of one quick example of, of work we're doing um, uh, in, in that direction as well. So that was sort of the concept behind what we started doing with this center. Um, and it all starts with the brain, right? So I'm in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm Terry Sinowski's warm up talk. He's gonna be talking about deep learning during the, the, the keynote. Um, and we're gonna, I want to talk about sort of the interface between uh, neuroscience and, and machine learning and sort of this, this relationship between engineering and, and neuroscience. So let's look at the brain a little bit. Let's start by looking at the real brain. Um, this, this never gets old. It's just absolutely fascinating, right? So here's three different scales of the brain, right? I don't have to tell this audience how multi-scale the, the, the human brain is, right? So the image in the middle, uh, that's a diffusion tensor imaging. We're looking at white matter, obviously, in cross-section from the side, um, looking at all the you know, high-speed ribbon cables, right? So this is you know, white matter uh, connections between different brain regions. You go down three orders of magnitude, and you end up at the image on the, on, on the left. Um, that's uh, Jeff, one of Jeff Flickman's uh, brain bone uh, mouse the, that actually fluoresces at those colors. And there you're looking at individual neuronal cell bodies and then the neuropil, that you know, spaghetti of connections, right, that exists above it. I mean, that's what a real network looks like to a neuroscientist, right? Now, three orders of magnitude is huge, right? And, you know, it's, it's the equivalent of, of going from, you know, no one would walk from New York to San Diego, but a one change in order of magnitude is the equivalent of going from walking to driving. Now you can get to San Diego in a matter of a few days. Two orders of magnitude is the equivalent of going from walking to flying. Three orders of magnitude would get you from New York to San Diego in a matter of, what, seconds maybe, right? So it's, it's, it's hard to kind of grasp exactly how you know, big three orders of magnitude is. And that's the change between the scale between those two images. It's the same network, but at two different scales. If we go down about another three orders of magnitude, you come down to this image over here. Here you're looking at uh, uh, electron microscopy cross sections. And the reconstruction you're going to see in a second is all the structure. It's all the stuff that fits in between just two synapses in the image on the left, right? Just um, you know, really, really rich spatial complexity in all this. This is a typical sort of, you know, we've seen examples of this, you know, kind of calcium imaging. This is a sparse network in vitro. These are hippocampal neurons, right? And, and we, can, we can visualize. We can, take, we can make qualitative movies. Of, you know, of, of, of information flow through, through these types of networks, right, which is very typical. We want to understand what are the algorithms that, that are driving this ultimately to be able to do that kind of engineering. So, you know, how, how is the brain different from machine learning, from the current state of the art, right? So, to me, it kind of comes down to these three, um, these three types of properties. And, and everything, all the work that we do, you know, there's plenty of fantastic work in, in sort of traditional machine learning going on. Um, we're really interested in things that the brain does really well that the existing state of the art in machine learning does not, right? And we want to understand why. 
um, and then do the engineering according to that. So how is the brain different? Well, adaptation, right? You know, the ability to adapt, along with that robustness and plasticity, right? The, the, the brain is incredibly robust. I'm going to show you a movie about how robust the human brain is in a second. Um, and obviously this idea of plasticity, where in the, in the brain function really does change structure, right? Certainly at the level of synaptic spines. Um, this is great, because usually for a lot of the audiences I speak to, I have to explain this in a lot more detail. But, but to this group, it's perfect. Um, you know, computation, abstraction, we, we, we learn by connecting the dots between concepts, right? Not by giving, we're not given, you know, a million data points and then asked to, uh, that we need to train our brains on, right? So this idea of abstraction, of connecting the dots between concepts is a critical component of how we learn. And then power, right? The, the brain is unbelievably power proficient. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kallenberg's lab has some of the world records in, in sort of modeling engineering systems that recreate that kind of power efficiency. So the brain is incredibly power efficient for the amount of computations that it does. So I'd like to show this as an example of, of sort of the abstraction, the connecting the dots piece. These two images of a cow are physically completely different from each other. One's a line drawing, the other one's a photograph. Uh, but a toddler very quickly starts to associate this as the same concept. You don't need to show a toddler, right, you know, thousands and thousands of images of different cows, different colors, different angles, right? You know, they start to put two and two together, right? This is how, this is how we learn. Very, very different from, uh, uh, from machine learning. Um, the, the, the sheer sort of size of this network, it's, it's worth sort of it's worth reflecting on some of these numbers. We have about 85 billion neurons in a typical adult human brain, uh, but another 86 billion non-neuronal cells. Uh, probably the most important of these from a computational perspective are, are, are probably astrocytes. I spent a big part of my career studying astrocytes. Um, they have astrocytes, aside from their classical homeostatic roles, have the molecular machinery to listen in on synaptic signaling through the tripartite synapse. So an astrocyte process will wrap around intimately around a synapse between a neuron. Um, and, and amazingly, uh, astrocytes have the molecular machinery to actually secrete neurotransmitters, which in that context we refer to as gliotransmitters. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a form of neuromodulation that we actually don't understand. There's a lot of speculation computationally what astrocytes might be doing, how they might be modulating neuronal, you know, neuronal signaling. But the truth is that it's, it's, it's one of the frontiers in neuroscience. We just do not know computationally what's going on. Um, so, you know, think about it, and astrocytes sort of map roughly one to one to the number of neurons. So you're talking about a network that's about this, you know, roughly the same size as the neuronal network that we have no clue what it actually does, right? Um, each neuron has about you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of synapses, and if you put it all together, you have about 10 to the 16 synapses total in a typical human brain. Uh, by comparison, there's about 10 to the 21 stars in the observable universe, so a few more orders of magnitude, but that's a huge number, right? That's a huge number. Um, okay, so. Let me set this movie up for you there, because um, uh, this really sort of drives a point home of sort of the plasticity and robustness of the human brain and how different it is from a computer or a machine. There's a pediatric form of epilepsy called Rasmussen's encephalitis. Um, it's this uh, debilitating disorder. Uh, usually it ends up with full hemispheric seizures, um, and these patients, most of these patients become refractory to medication, so they stop responding to medicines. And so the end treatment is a neurosurgeon goes in and performs a hemispherectomy, uh, which means they remove the entire half of the affected cortex um, or a functional hemispherectomy where they cut the corpus callosum. And uh, so this is one little video of, a, of a, a one a young patient's journey. I got permission from the mom to show this. Uh, and uh, this little guy went through this uh, incredible procedure uh, before turning 10, which is pretty typical for these patients. So this is sort of immediately post-op a few days uh, after the surgery. Notice the craniotomy, right? Because you, you know, you're removing half the brain. Um, he's, he's tired, he's weak. He's burning thousands of calories here, just recovering. Um, uh, you know, kind of has a hard time walking. There's some hemiparesis on the contralateral side. That's, that's pretty typical. 
So this is some immediately after the sort of a few days after the surgery. Now look at this. Four months later, he's balancing on a ball essentially, right? With now think about it. He's got half his cortex, right? He's got half a brain essentially. By five months, this is him in the middle here. He's playing uh, soccer. Now think about the how think about the coordination involved in him to be able to do that. It's just five months after having half his cortex removed. Uh, by seven months, you know, he's going up two steps at a time. You're going to see him jump from off the steps here. Right? And, and these patients are essentially cognitively intact. Notice there's a little bit of residual hemiparesis. That's that, that, tends, that often stays. Um, but, but cognitively, just almost perfectly normal. Right? Unbelievable degree of plasticity. You know, imagine going into your laptop and pulling out even just a few transistors, right? It's kind of, you know, big, big difference. So, you know, the, the, the total computational space of, of the brain is, is somehow captured within this network. It's captured within these interactions and the states that it's taking. Um, the, the brain does not learn by randomly searching for a solution. It doesn't learn by backpropagation, right? It doesn't learn. It's not trained. It doesn't encode information using sort of the algorithms that we, we associate with a typical state of the art in machine learning. Right? And so the question, you know, the question is why? And then how can we take advantage of what the brain does do? So let's talk about machine learning a little bit. Let's contrast sort of the brain part that we just kind of went through with, with machine learning. So machine learning, the you know, current state of the art, does some, some pretty amazing things. Um, you, these are you know, pretty obvious, you know, personal assistance and product recommendation. Obviously, we, we've heard you know, self-driving autonomous vehicles. Uh, this is one of my favorites. There's a company that, that uh, pulls together sort of the, a lot of the news-breaking blurbs that you see are actually pulled together by an AI algorithm uh, and then followed up by a human reporter. All right? um, and uh, uh, this, this video game here is, that's not a, it's not a photograph of two football players. It's actually a, a still shot from the uh, 2018 version of Madden Football. Um, so I'm going to show you a little, a little video here, which is kind of neat. So this is what Madden Football started out as. This is a purely physics-based rule engine, right? Pretty primitive. Uh, this was uh, early 80s or so. And this is a, this is a really cool video because they put together every year Madden football is like on its 20th year or something like that. Every year that they, um, sorry, that they, uh, that it's gone on, and I'm going to fast forward through this, and you can kind of see it getting better and better. It's like a 20-minute video, better. And then if you go all the way to now, you know, it looks like this, right? So there's, there's, this, there's machine learning in how the players react, Right, and, and the adaptation to how the player is playing, and, and also in, in the graphics part as well. Okay, so in a couple of years, I mean, we're not, you're not going to be able to differentiate between what's a real football game and what's a video game practically. Really amazing stuff. But of course, machine learning does have limitations, and, and that's the point, right? Um, model bias, model constraints, overfitting to data, Model saturation, where, where you, you can't learn, uh, even though you give, you give, the, mod, you give the system uh, more data. Okay? And we already talked about training, sort of this idea that you know, the current the machine learning cannot extrapolate beyond the training set. Okay? So it can find incredibly subtle patterns, in some cases much better than humans, uh, but it's constrained by that training set. So it was a study by, it was when I came across a, a headline uh, one time it ended up actually aggravating me because the, the headline was MIT creates psycho killer artificial intelligence. And when I went and read the story, what they did was they, they trained uh, sort of a standard deep neural network on uh, just you know, really disturbing and gory images from Reddit, right? And that's what the system was trained on. So, so of course, you give it anything else, you give it a picture of a fluffy kitten, and it's going, to, it's going to pigeonhole that picture into something that it's been trained on, right? So you know, machine learning architectures can't extract beyond that, which is, again, sort of a fundamental limitation in the algorithms. Um, it also leads to kind of some amusing uh, uh, things that happen. So there was a news story that on, on Amazon's Alexa. And in the news story, they, um, they ordered a dollhouse as an example. 
uh, and of course, you know, triggered Alexas in, in people's homes, and all these people started getting dollhouse deliveries that they never ordered. Um, so Amazon had to, you know, refund all their money. Google had a similar experience with a Super Bowl ad, right? Because uh, it's because there isn't, you know, it's not real sort of adaptation here. It's so here's another good example: human language, right? So, hey, thanks for defining the word "many" for me. It means a lot, right? So for for us, you know, we get it. You know, it's it's a play on words, right? It has two meanings. But this is exactly the kind of thing that just confuses a machine, right? Especially if it hasn't been sort of purposely trained on this. <clears throat> so we. We, we started getting interested in sort of this, this interface between neuroscience and machine learning and um, the idea of sort of contextual AI and, and in particular machine inference, right? Um, so again, sort of borrowing from the brain and trying to understand, um, you know, what are the algorithms that, that these types of systems, that, that the brain actually uh, uh, has. Um, we started developing a sort of fundamentally new architecture. The goal here was to be able to do machine learning without any training, um, eventually sort of in real time as data kind of streams in. And to do this, of course, we, we can't use existing algorithms. Uh, so what we did, and this is just sort of a conceptual picture, I'm not gonna go through the details of any of this in this talk, but just to give you a sense of sort of how we're building this, um, the way that we encode data in this architecture is not by adjusting the weights of a neural network, but we encode the data in the dynamic patterns that a piece of input data sort of triggers, okay? Um, now, these are spatial temporal networks. So the, the networks in this case have a particular actual geometry. That geometry matters, which means that temporal latencies matters. And when you, when you uh, build in a notion of a refractory state to the individual nodes, the resulting dynamics, so think about sort of dynamic patterns carving its way through this geometric network as a function of the pattern of the initial stimulating nodes, right, which directly map to an input, okay? Um, those dynamic patterns, when they reach a steady state, now encode that piece of input data. Okay, so, uh, and what we've actually done is the, the, sort of the, the theoretical foundation behind this is it, it models a, a form of, of spatial and temporal summation, right, which is, you know, canonical, you know, neurophysiology. Um, this, this part here has, it, it has, uh, there's, there's a little bit of overlap with some of the work that's been done, for example, with liquid state machines previously, okay, where this work sort of departs radically uh, is in the, what we do with those dynamic patterns um, after that data has been encoded. So we don't have a readout layer. We, we take that actual dynamics and, and take that, and then uh, and we reduce that. So we use, uh, we use uh, uh, algebraic topology and graph theory methods to take that high dimensional dynamics and essentially reduce it down to, uh, for conceptual purposes, you know, a, a point in a metric space. Now this is a mathematical metric space, which means it has a, a certain structure to it. Um, and uh, the closer two inputs are to each other, the closer they end up in that metric space, right? As you start to populate that data cloud, you can now start to do, for example, classification on that growing data that you're populating in this metric space. Um, notice that there's no training involved, right? Where those points up in that metric space through this topological encoding is directly a function of the input and the dynamic model on these geometric networks. Okay, the, the weights in these networks are set randomly. Uh, we can explore optimizing those weights, but, but we haven't yet. We've sort of been focused on the dynamics. So if you have just one input, right, you can't train a neural network on one input, right, but in our case, if you have just one input, that's fine, that's just one point in this space. If you have two, it's two points, right? There's, there's no limitation on, you know, sort of how much data you need. Um, and the way that this code is being written, uh, we have a couple of ways that we're pursuing this. We have a, we have a I just finished a year-long sabbatical with Microsoft. We have a version of it there. Um, we have a version that we're building with Lawrence Livermore National Labs. 
they have an infrastructure that's able to do very high parallelization. Then. So we're, you know, we're kind of playing around with the implementation piece um, to kind of build this system. But it's all based on, on a modeling, like I said, really sort of undergraduate level neurophysiology with spatial and temporal summation. So I'll show you a couple of examples of what we did. So uh, we used, uh, as, just as a test case, our, our objective wasn't to do visual recognition, but, but it's a, a problem space that computer scientists are comfortable with. Uh, so we used the MNIST database to, MNIST is this very large database of handwritten characters. Um, and uh, we, 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 we ran through these numbers and encoded different digits through this dynamic model. And you can kind of see the different dynamic patterns, for example, of, of you know, some of these examples of these digits. Um, what you're seeing here are self-classifying point clouds, right, where each group essentially belongs to a, one of the different digits, right? Because the zeros, despite all being different, written by hand by many different people, um, they're all more similar to each other than some of the other digits. And so by encoding the data and the dynamics and then putting it in, like I said, sort of this topological graphical metric space, we get this self-classification that's occurring, right? So again, no, no training in this case. This is just to give you sort of a, a, a visual sense of what this looked like. So this, this is just three representations of the evolving dynamics in these networks, right, in these geometric networks. Uh, as, as they encode that data, right? As, as those dynamics essentially carve out a path uh, through this space. Um, now we have, on top of the encoding process, we have started playing around with actual learning. So what you're seeing there is uh, the, the pink and the blue correspond to two different digits, two different classes of digits. And if you look at the boundary between the data, there's obvious separation, but there's, there's some overlap, right? There, there is sort of a fuzzy area, you know, where, where the digits overlap and we can't distinguish them. Um, that's the data encoding piece. If we then actually run STDP, so spike timing dependent plasticity rule, on top of the encoding piece on the dynamics, um, we are actually able to get better separation, which kind of makes sense. Um, and so now that boundary becomes much sort of much more refined. So the dynamic model itself, given the origins from the neurophysiology, is able to, to, to learn, to refine basically itself and its ability to do the classification, in this case using an STDP uh, learning rule. Now in other cases, so this is C. elegans, the worm, right? Um, in some cases we said, well, what, what if we run this dynamic model and the underlying geometric model, geometric network that we use, is not something that, an architecture that we create, but a, an actual biological connectome, right? So what we did is we took the, a feeding circuit from C. elegans, and um, these two dark nodes here correspond to sensory neurons that essentially detect a piece of food, right? They're chemosensors. And then there's a bunch of hidden neurons, and the output to this circuit are, are, are two um, populations of motor neurons uh, that, that caused the worm to go back and forth. And, um, and so we ran our dynamic model both in the feeding circuit in isolation and the feeding circuit embedded in the entire connectome. And what you're seeing here is a visualization of all the signals summating in the worm's connectome. And um, uh, green is excitatory, red is inhibitory. Uh, and and uh, that, again, that propagates through, in this case, the backbone structure is the network of the worm. Now the cool thing was that we didn't model the physiology. We, we just took advantage of the actual connectivity of the worm and what we were able to extract was the oscillatory back and forth firing of the two populations of motor neurons. Okay, so the lesson here is that in this particular connectome, even though it's a worm and it has you know, 302 neurons, it is actually really well designed. There's a purpose to the connectome of this worm, okay? That, that is really kind of interesting. So, as I said, at, you know, closer to the beginning of the talk, we, we the, the machine learning part, this architecture that we're building has a whole bunch of different applications, in particular to situations where you have sparse data, 
incomplete data or, or where you need to do sort of machine learning in real time, right? Those are the type of applications that are generating interest for, you know, for, for using this. Um, but of course, you know, as I said, we, we really want to come back to understanding the brain, to the neuroscience from the engineering. And so this is an example of that. Um, this is a paper that we published uh, uh, last year. And in this paper, we asked the question, uh, why do neurons have the shape that they do, right? Why do neurons have sort of this convoluted morphology? Now, in this work, a network was an individual neuron, a basket cell to be specific. Okay, and we've known for, uh, for a long time that neurons neither signal as fast as they can, um, but they, they, they're also not optimized to minimize the wiring length, okay? So these, you know, if you think of this as a network, you know, these aren't straight line edges, right, connecting this, you know, this, this graph here. So the, the, the morphology of neurons are optimized for something in the middle, and the question is what? Um, one of the consequences of the theoretical part of this work that led to the machine learning architecture part was a, a, a proof that emerged, uh, a constraint on the optimal efficiency of signaling on a network. Okay, so let me explain this very briefly. So if you have a network of connected nodes, it turns out that, and, and if it's a geometric network, okay, the, the time that it takes signals to propagate on those edges, right, or, or inversely, the latency on those edges uh, has to be balanced to, relative to the internal dynamics of the individual nodes. So the amount of time that individual nodes need to hold on to a piece of information to process that internally has to balance how fast information is propagating on the network. If there is an imbalance in that ratio, we've shown in other work, signaling in that network completely breaks down, okay? And so what we did was we, 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 we defined some mathematical constraints on what that balance needs to be. Um, the, the theoretical ideal of that ratio approaches unity, okay, uh, between sort of the internal refractory state of a node and the rate of propagation. And that's what we looked for in these real neurons. Okay, we took, we took high resolution detailed morphological reconstructions and we took individual branches of these neurons and computed this ratio across 14,000 different branches across 57 neurons and computed what we call this refractory ratio and compared it to how close does it get to the theoretical ideal of unity. And in the real neurons, the, the median ratio approached 0.92. Okay, so very, very close. When we took the median of the medians, because in some cases, if you have a neuron contributing more processes than other neurons, it could skew the data of the entire population. So this is a, a normalization procedure. The median is still 0.91. Okay, so very, very close to that theoretical ideal. And, and the argument that we made in this paper was that you know, this, this ratio could be what the morphology of these neurons are being optimized for, what's being preserved. And this wasn't a serendipitous discovery. We, we went looking for this because the, the mathematics pointed us in that direction. So, so where are we now? Well, so I'll leave you kind of with some, some final thoughts here, right? So on the, on the one hand, there, there's, there's a lack of theory in all this, okay? Uh, sort of in machine learning in, in, in general, really, and in particular, sort of in machine learning coming from the neuroscience. And if you look at the popular press, that leads to a lot of opinions and speculation, right? Um, but but we, we really sort of need more theory. There's, there's still sort of an open question of what's the right balance between algorithms and hardware and data, right? You know, how do you construct a system that balances these three? That's another sort of open area. Um, if you're going to have a conversation about sort of machine inference or, or, or contextual AI, uh, it, it's important to put it, frame it in the right context, no pun intended, right? There has to be sort of an application. Otherwise, these conversations can lead to confusion. Um, uh, and, and of course, we don't understand the brain. We don't fully understand the brain. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants here as we try to apply neuroscience to machine learning. 
So, you know, I, I think that um, I've argued in, in writing that I think if you're going to do machine learning uh, in a way that should inform neuroscience, right? Uh, that engineering, uh, the, the algorithms that are created should be what, what are, you know, either accountable, sort of explainable AI, right? So we have to move away from kind of this, this black box model of, of machine learning. Um, we have to be able to track it back to, to processes that we understand. Um, in particular, like I said, we're interested in classes of problems where traditional machine learning fails by, by, by design. And finally, you can't throw the kitchen sink at this, right? So, you know, sort of trial and error engineering will only get you so far. And I really, you know, I really do think that this all has to be based on, on theoretical understanding if we're going to kind of merge neuroscience with the future of machine learning. And with that, I'll stop. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, very nice uh, set of ideas. I wonder if you've thought about um, how a neuron gets to where it does, right? It starts as a cell that protrudes. And it uh, generally, by, in humans, by around six years, is much bigger than it will eventually be, and so it then sculpts down. So that suggests that some of the measurements that you're looking at are actually functionally determined. They're not, they're, there isn't a program that gets to that particular morphology or that yeah. particular neuron. And in fact, if we look at a number of basket cells, they're not identical by, by a great, by a lot. It, you know, you can recognize a basket cell, but they're not the same thing. And so what you have is a, a developmental program which has several levels of stochasticness or stochasticity or whatever it is. And that, that needs to be built into the way you're modeling things because how it gets there, I think, is quite critical. Yeah, I, I actually couldn't agree more. So uh, just to kind of uh, give you a sense of how important that is, and, and this, is an, this is an area that we've started to look at uh, quite closely, is the, the development of evolution of how neurons and neural circuits and networks evolve and, and actually develop. Um, the, the biggest challenge that we've had has been we have no real way, there, there's no theoretical foundation that allows us, there's no guide for how to build spatially what the right architecture of a network should be on which to run the dynamic model on top of it, right? So we can borrow from neurobiology the way we did with C. elegans. We, we can, you know, try the best that we can. So we've been playing around, for example, with stochastic block models where each block is a, a stochastic random network and then you have connectivity be between blocks, right? But, but the truth is that we have no real theory on, from an engineering perspective, on what the, the, what the structure should be on which the dynamics is running. And, and so in that sense, we've started to look really seriously at, at basically development and how, you know, how the brain actually develops in that sense. Yeah, please. What you've described uh, sounds quite a bit like uh, multi-dimensional similarity analysis with the addition of delays to make it dynamic. I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you're using topology to uh, represent the similarities between things in the real world and the similarities between the patterns in the network. Yeah, what, what, what we're doing there is um, we we, we are using graphlets, okay, which is essentially a catalog, if you will, of ways that that dynamic pattern uh, can be constructed from 
simpler topological structures, and in particular these, these graphlet structures. So we essentially have a, a, a catalog of uh, some you know, n-dimensional set of graphlets, and, and then what we're doing is we, we are building up to what that dynamic structure is from that catalog. Um, and, and there's a whole literature of mathematics around that. Uh, now, we've had to adapt that to this particular application. Um, and, and then once we have that built up, it turns out that, that the way that you build it um, conforms to the sort of the right set of rules for defining a metric space. And, and so the way that we build those, that dynamic structure from these graphlets um, is constrained in a way that, that one can, can apply sort of the, the mathematical definition of what a metric space is, right? Um, and so that's the approach that we're taking. Um, and we now are building an algorithm that will allow, so we've been working really hard on the fundamental mathematics of that. And we're now at the point where we're building an algorithm to do that. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much for this wonderful talk.